gentlemen, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my uh, shop. My name is Keith and I'm going to be your host. And welcome back to Intentional Disregard. I had to uh, have to make a couple comments uh, uh, just after reading the comments on part one. And uh, one is uh, I noticed the blame game going on. And, you know, it's, yeah, if you had one owner that did his own maintenance operation and expenses and all the planning... And he ended up with a machine like this. Yeah, yeah, it was his fault. Um, but if you have um, a company uh, with uh, supervisors and you might have a foreman, you might have a maintenance man, and then you have um, the, uh, the skilled labor that's uh, operating the machine, that's a team. And... If this happens, it's a failure of the team, no matter how you want to pass the buck. You know, I, I have a cutoff line that's ridiculous. And that is when you have a bushing and a bore and you have X amount of wear on that pin and you're exceeding or starting to lose that sleeve bushing bearing and taking a chance to the next step of damaging the housing ear structure arm clevis pin support that's you've crossed the line you don't even have to get across that line for a decent operator to know that there's an issue Because let's just say that pivot point right there, that pivot line, was nice and tight. Nothing wrong with it. And you had an eighth of an inch of play in this uh, pivot or motion uh, the position here that's going to move it. That position is X amount of distance from that pivot. So that eighth of an inch... Uh, play is within that but your attachment goes on to here whether it be forks bucket or whatever now the tip of that instrument that you're or or tool that you're putting onto this thing whatever distance that is divided by this distance right here gives you the ratio of the motion out there okay if you have an eighth of an inch in a foot here and you're five feet out there you're going to have five eighths of an inch of play out there on the end of there a good operator is going to know that you know this is that's for up and down uh, tilting on this piece right here but let's just say it was on an excavator and it was maybe on the swing control even though the swing most of the time is uh, chain or dual cylinders or whatever but it's still and, and you have play in the linkage all the way through there but it through your your upper and lower arm or dipper or whatever you've got on that piece of equipment that magnifies way out there. Operator is the first one to know that there is play. From there, he, he's got you know, people that he's going to report to, um, and or if he's in charge of all phases of that machine, then it's up to him. Um, so I had to laugh about the blame game, and uh, it, it's it, it's not it's not about blaming. It's about picking a time and. Fixing it, all right. Um, so I've uh, I've got the ears in there at the mill, um, and one of the other comments was, <clears throat> "Go ahead, would have uh, uh, plasma cut a a pilot hole to start with," and you know that's that's all well indeed, but my power on my plasma cutting 
is not going to pierce through that one inch and give a nice clean hole. So by just taking and deciding not to do that and go right to drilling, I can stack them up in my nice big drill press in there and I'll be able to <clears throat> I'll be able to go ahead and put the uh, the the right size bore right in here. In fact, I'm going to prepare these ears all the way out to where I got the hub on the sides and the bearings pressed in and got the pin fit and then we're going to be bringing them over and I'm going to weld them to this and maintain that fit on that pin so that I don't have to line bore these at all. I'm going to manufacture these then weld them on here and they'll be usable. That's my plan. All right, I've got my gear set up. I've already got my cutting torch on here. I pulled off my, uh, my uh, number three torch that I use for heat straightening. So I got this on here. I've already cleaned the tip. Now I take, I take a file and I clean the flat and then I take, I take my tip cleaners. And I mean, everybody has their own way of doing tip cleaning and, and this and that. But I, what, before I put it on the hose, so I just have the one thing, the one piece right here to hold. And I kind of work my two hands right here in front of me and I use my chest to actually kind of control that. If I don't have that finesse, especially when you get down on the smaller ones right there, I tend to bend these things pretty easy. I, I, I just, I don't know, that's, that's what happens to me. Um, anyhow, torch is ready to go and my gas is on. Now this is a number two uh, cutting uh, tip, uh, number two dash one dash one oh one. That's the style and everything else um, that I run here with my Victors. All right, and uh, oh, I did want to say this is a new mixing barrel that was given to me, and I finally put it on last year, and it has the arresters built into it. I'm not a hundred percent happy with this mixing barrel, and I think I'm going to be putting on my back on my 1970s mixing barrel which has external um, spark arresters on it and it doesn't give me any issues at all as far as flow and I can even run another rosebud on here without any faulty gas mixing and popping and uh, and losing uh, the uh, supply of fuel to the individual torches Anyway, uh, you know, without going up to a bigger size mixing barrel. But I do notice that the internal spark arresters do restrict flow in this versus the old one. All right. So I got my hood here. I like the face shield because I have prescription glasses and I, uh, I uh, uh, progressive. And I have to see what I'm doing. And I, I just, I can't put on just a standard pair of goggles anymore. Not, I've, I've aged progressed in age all right um, we're gonna have to take this top ear first I would normally take the bottom one first so it's out of the way when I go to cut this one here so we're gonna have a little bit of a splash here I've got this I've got ventilation fan that I need to put on I've got the door open at the other end already I've got sheet of steel down on here so that the molten metals will drop onto the plate and not pop the concrete, uh, especially this time of year where you got moisture and everything else in there. Um, and I got a shield, this piece of uh, aluminum. I'm gonna put it in here so that any splashback is gonna come back and uh, not come back and it's not gonna get into my boots, my socks, and or destroy my brand new flannel line pants. Let's uh, see how we do here. Plant panels in, fans on, and bleed a little acetylene here. Okay, bring in some oxygen. Lots of times the key is not to get the hiss of your torch. You have your torch nice and mild and have have really sharp cones and every one of them is a nice cone shape nice and clean tip no feathering all right 
Okay, now we're going to put our hood down and we're going to do the final adjustment on our torch. We adjust it twice, once without giving it the burst of oxygen, but once we do give the burst of oxygen, we want those cones to be, or the tips, or the blue tips of the flame, we want it to be even tighter, meaning less fuzzy. Okay. All right, now we're just gonna come in here next to the edge here. It's a big piece, so it's going to take a lot of heat to get it. Once you get a good heat going where you're working at, then we'll be able to take it from there. Now we're going to we're going to be using it more like a whittle, and we're not really just going to make a cut and go straight on through there. We're going to we're going to be pulling it and working back and forth. Is we want to take, we want to remove that material down as close as we can, and you can remove the weld and that one piece without destroying the base metal. I'm just coming in just above that wall right now because I'm going to go ahead and come back and grab that after we have the bulk of this right off of here. And if you want to see how you're doing, you just bring it on out. We're going to drop that piece off of there and then we'll get a look at what we're doing. Okay, so we almost got just the height of that weld with a cut straight across there. And we'll be able to bring that in and really tune that right to the edge. Because what you'll do is you'll see that base metal in the center there will eventually get it to where you get close enough and it's red, red hot. And the weld will be base color or the material will, that's weld bead is actually absorbed into the base metal and it'll let you see that thin web that's there. You'll be able to skin this thing right on down to where it'll be nice and clean. Minimum amount of grinding. And it's really not that, it's, you know, everybody's going to a whole bunch of smoke and everything else like that. Well, if you got the part cleaned off, which I, re I expect stuff that needs to be repaired to come into the shop clean so that you can work on it without smoke and flames and pollution. All right, let's continue on here. Reposition. I was choking it up into my belly there a little bit, so. Keeping the angle on, of your torch is key. Keep it square to where you want. We'll go ahead and we're going to take this piece off of here now. We don't have to see this thing whole. We already know what shape it is. All right, a little slag is probably holding that. Probably where I stopped there for a second. Right in this neck of the woods here.
All right, we're staying we're staying nice and close to it. We're not gouging into the basement material or the back the back of this support here. All right, here we go. Okay, that angle or that weld changed a little bit right here, so I came out a little bit, but there's no worries about that. All right, I'm going to go get my slag hammer just so that I have the paw so I can, I can move and I can chip a little bit away if I need to. We'll be back in a second. Just got my chipping hammer here to just kind of move this stuff away so it doesn't really stick around. All right. That bottom stuff, it really doesn't matter too much. We're going to be working at the top, and we're going to start. And uh, we can even start over here and kind of work our way back that way there. Okay, let's go ahead and we're going to start right here. Because I can see behind. I need to see the back side where...
Okay, we're gonna reposition ourselves so we can see a little better around here. Okay, we're gonna chip that off and then we're gonna take that lower one right off of there. We've got this right close there. We have a couple areas right in here where the flames went just a little bit across the top, but uh, I, I'm sure if we grind or whatever that's and get some of this out of the way here, um, it's it barely, barely put a scar across there. All right. We're ready to take this one here. Now this is where that crack came all the way in here. So we don't know how this is gonna affect our cutting this off of here until we get close enough to see what's going on. And then even after we cut this off of here, we're probably gonna have to V in to this back backup plate here as well. And then we're gonna be looking at the front surfaces and how flat they are, whether they're dished or not. And then we'll decide if we're going to put some kind of a strong back attachment or something on the other side so that we'll be controlling the flatness of the face of this attachment. pulling out the shield from that part right there so it can lay back so I can get a lower lower angle in here with the torch still have a little bit of protection against my toes there all right I'm gonna do the same thing again I like coming in here drawing it back I don't know if I can get that down at the lower lowest angle there. Maybe we back up a little bit. Get our arm reach out a little bit. There we go. Okay. We'll play with it like that. We'll see how that goes. I just wanted to see how how much that angle is that I'm taking there because we've got this weld holding out the torch just a little bit more so I want to make sure that I'm not angling into the body itself. I think I'm going to do away with this uh, shield here so I can get in here and I can see a little better.
See how <clears throat> that crack and that the wall beads there, but there's that crack. It actually looks like they tried to fix that crack at one time. And we don't know any more than what it's gonna take as we go in. Alright, now we're gonna we're gonna start whittling back like we did on the top. All right, looks like I can take some of that weld right off the top there. Let's see if uh, see how that plays out. But you notice how it's not really, really a whole bunch smoky and everything else? Well, that's because it doesn't have a bunch of grease on there to start with.
Okay, we're gonna let that cool down. We'll knock off the rest of the slag there. And then we're gonna hit it with a grinder and we're gonna kind of get a look at it. Coming back in here to the K&T and we got to clear off uh, some of our stuff here. We're going to put box up the uh, uh, the wedges that pop in the bottom and the handles. We have our two ears that are replacing the ones we just cut off. This surface here and this surface here, of course, we're going to we'll do this by hand here. Just all we want to do is make sure that we are square. So when these things fit down on there, um, uh, they don't have a tendency to pull more than uh, one way than the other way. If we leave this just a torch cut here, it's going to want to follow that torch cut. And if we can lay them perfectly flat to the surface we're going to dress and grind, um, they're going to stay where we want them easier. Weld will pull. Weld will make this thing want to go all over the place. We're going to control the weld so it will go where we want it to go. All right, so we're going to clear this off, get this ready, and we're going to skim the underside of these. Mm -hmm. 